are here with Karen Crago and Lynette Cadel. Uh, Karen Crago is our current uh, Missouri Laureate for 2020-2021. And Lynette Cadel is a professor of English at Missouri State University. Thank you guys for joining us. Sure, happy to be here. Thank you, Charlie. And you guys will be doing a poetry workshop for us this evening, doing some readings and um, talking about some prompts to give people. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, I, I'm going to move to the prompts right now. Let's see if I can get that share screen going the way it should. Chances are I can. Um, there. So here we are. Uh, it's National Poetry Month. So we thought we'd go back to basics with the prompts. Um, two poets, four simple poetry prompts. And here they are. <laughs> so write these down. Try them at home. Okay, I hope that this is large enough for people. Um, first one, the eavesdropper. And I'll be reading my, uh, the first poem that I read, I use this prompt. Write a poem that uses a phrase you overheard. And the alternative is sometimes it's interesting if you mishear what they say too. Um, that can be an interesting poem. Uh, the next one, The Stolen Moment. Write a poem that uses a scene you witness between two other people. And I am going to show a poem with where that happened. Um, and then, Karen, do you want me to uh, read yours as well? Go or for it. Or would you like to read it? Here. Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so confusion, this prompt asks you to sow confusion with a deliberate mishearing of a word or a phrase. You'll hear me read a poem tonight called The Customs of Grief, in which I um, think about not the customs, what we do when we grieve, but as if grief were a country and we had to go through customs at the airport and declare what we had found. So, but that's just an example of a prompt that mishears a word kind of something to try. This one is called Roadside America, and it's kind of an older poem of mine, but I thought you might have fun with the project. Um, but the prompt is to write a poem about a funky roadside attraction, like a museum, and you could fill it with exhibits to suit whatever theme you come up with. You'll hear me read a poem called The Museum of Things You Can't Fix, which was a really fun um, poem to write because I got to fix a lot of things that I'd screwed up in my life. <laughs> So that's coming, listen for it, but give it a try yourself. It's, it's a, the, the results are surprising and kind of fun. And I want to make sure to uh, show this as well. Um, you can follow Karen on Twitter. Oh, I misspelled it, Karen. It's Karenka writes. Oh yeah, Karen, K-A. Karen, Karen, K-A, <laughs> writes. You noticed that, sorry. Ah, and her blog is Better View of the Moon, and this gives the address. And I'm on Instagram, Lynette Cadel, all one word. I'm also on Twitter, LL Cadel, and I blog at the unimaginative uh, title, LynetteCadel.com. But you're the only one. <laughs> I think they kind of want it to work that way, that you're the only <laughs> one. <laughs> So I'm going to lead off the reading and then we'll have the glorious finish with our Missouri Poet Laureate. <laughs> uh, the, my first poem is my eavesdropping poem and it's titled The Last Trip to El Dorado. I'm in El Dorado now and it's a small town in Kansas. Um, and that's probably enough that needs to be said. What was the eavesdropping? Uh, it was me 
overhearing the phrase, poor people have poor ways, spoken by my then boss, Ruth Watkins, who is a local realtor. And she was saying it in the kindest possible way to uh, explaining to somebody else why somebody did something that just sounded stupid to them. She's like, well, you know, they're poor. <laughs> poor people have poor ways. So um, here it is, the last trip to El Dorado. It used to be my house, and after the big hailstorm, I picked weathered brown shingles, not black or white, and painted it craftsman khaki with two trim colors. The choice was right, but I've learned that some people decide based on what used to cost more and no longer does, or by the largest swatch on the card. Someone sometimes said that white paint was cheaper or maybe conformity has more fans. The 1912 airplane bungalow is now watered down white. That paint that doesn't really cover and flakes fast, it flaked. My friend Ruth always said, poor people have poor ways, but she was much nicer than me when she said it. I blame them not for flaking paint, but for the boatloads of stupid that refuse to choose when choices are there and easy every single day. Expensive paint covers better and means you use less and repaint less often. Pretty costs the same as ugly, but then maybe they don't see the ugly. The new owners were having a yard sale because the hospital was still buying off the neighborhood one block at a time, but they had time yet. Along with broken auto tools, crumpled clothes, and half burnt candles up on the now wide porch rails was a line of heavy plastic figurines with sayings on them, the demented and cheaper versions of precious moments which are the demented and cheaper versions of Sistine angels. Just imagine the little angel children, only coarser and enclosed because naked would be wrong. Their smiles pursed to belch. They had at least 30 of them in a row with captions that say things like, I myth you and watch out, I'm sexy, in all caps like chalkboard writing. If you believe in the power of things, the creation of critical mass that defines your space, you also believe that objects speak, they shriek out. The precious moment chapel, a monument to purity and pastels in the Ozarks, which could be almost Kansas, but of course is not. I live where trees grow without irrigation and hills don't have to be marked hillside street to be noticed. I don't have any reason to take that drive now from Springfield to Wichita. My mother's dead and her ashes rest in an outdoor chapel that is always inside and outside. Marble walls framing two walls of glass that let the wide emptiness in. So green, so flat so carefully groomed, unmistakable for any place but Kansas. That niche was much too large, full coffin sized. And I can hear her saying, no, I want the big one. So yeah, that was sometimes poems demand be written in. That was one that Yes, I had the phrase, but I also had the situation of my mother's death and, and returning for a funeral in Wichita. Um, the next poem is for the other prompt, the scene. And I'm going to flat out say the scene was a scene between some co-workers of mine when I wor worked at um, Crown Center in Kansas City in retail long ago, I was in my 20s then, and one of my co-workers um, was very pregnant and she got a burn on her arm from ironing and had to, you know, 
do things that did not involve drugs to take care of it. And one of the older coworkers just kind of said things like, oh, oh you won't feel the pain talking about birth. You won't feel the pain. It's the pain is nothing. You, when you see that beautiful face, your baby, it's all gonna be worth it. And I'm sure many people that have heard those words, but hmm, hmm. And here's the poem, it's called The Cure. Salt has curative power, a cleansing burn for infection before it spreads or mutates into a boil. A boiling sore is animate, says what's cooking inside before skin breaks and the proof comes out. Even now, there are those who must rely on salt, like the pregnant woman who burned her arm ironing. It was deep, bone deep. And as each layer of flesh reformed, she had to scrape and retreat, a going back, but not far enough back to change what fortune dealt her. Becoming a mother wasn't supposed to be like this, all messy and full of pus. It was her hope to stack wishes like terry cloth sleepers in the closet to ignore birth stories like the one shared by a woman from work who gave birth so long ago, her hallway was lined with bearded sons in portraits by Olin Mills. The pain is nothing, she says. The pain is forgotten. Even the sweat and the puffing that stalls the inevitable until the doctor says to go ahead and push. She denies pain to others, scrubs memory until it fades, an echo to the scrunched up raging face that also fades into the pale silence of a sleeping child, her cure. Okay, those were my two prompt poems. Um, today's a special day in my family, besides being special for this reading, today's my daughter's birthday and um, here, here's a poem that I wrote um, for her. It's called Provenance. The pearls were bought at my uncle's jewelry store in Ludington, Michigan for my mother's 16th birthday and passed down to me for high school graduation. The me in sandals and India cotton who was dumbfounded at the concept of cotillion and debutantes. Um, and couldn't see a time when they would feel right around my neck. My uncle's store is gone. So is my uncle. True Midwesterners give directions by what isn't there. The pearls need skin to keep their patina and we find our way by landmarks that hover at a flicker of an eyelid but aren't there for outsiders who need road signs. Turn left at the corner where the IGA used to be that turned into Mike's Apple Market, the one that got torn down for the hospital annex. The present has no part in this. The house you buy is the Johnson house, five families removed from the oil workers who bought it in 1912. No Johnson in sight, but they were, and the toy car my daughter digs up planting marigolds was rubbed to bare metal by tiny fingers, preserved by the natural oils left by their hands, proof that they were, and each pebble knows it, forms a provenance more powerful than any landmark. I wear pearls now, but not the ones my mother gave me. My daughter has those and adds one more line to, in the provenance, a line that may read, worn with jeans and given by her mother, along with a patina of stubbornness that needs no sense of direction or landmarks, a purposefulness that coats these pearls with the oil, the warmth of living flesh. Happy birthday, Paige. So those were all fairly long poems. I don't always write long poems. Um, 
and I don't always write about people and situations. I'm going to read a few smaller ones that have animals in them. This is a Springfield poem, by the way, a Springfield, Missouri poem. It's called Broken Sonnet with Birds. The birds swirl round the feeder on my deck as if it were the only source of food. Of course it's not. My neighbor feeds them too, competing with the others on the block. The title ecological kingpin is the reward. The battle is fierce. He has a cardinal feeder in the front a smaller one for finches in the back. And just for luck, a hummingbird saloon. He needs that luck. His outdoor cat got hit by lightning just last March. I think the birds did it. I don't know how. They flutter hate like semaphore and the cat twitches back while birds dive for seed pods on the driveway. We didn't put this as a prompt, but sometimes works of art can inspire poems. And um, you might be familiar with the work of art in this title, Hopper's Nighthawks, Large Ginger Cat Remix. Another night at the diner and the greenish light gives a clue that this cup of coffee may be the last. The end of the world is looming outside and it looks hungry. Ginger cats need four squares plus extras and this one is door high and tired of waiting. Where is the milk? The greasy burgers he smelled blocks away. He would even take a strawberry if you rolled it outside. This is how it could end. One soft pounce outside the door or an open maw waiting for food in suits to walk in. Or it's barely possible. Humans will exit with pie and tuna salad offerings that postpone death for another night. Well, here's a little more optimistic one, still in the, well, I don't know, the animal kingdom, we'll see. I call it partly shining. It doesn't do to have expectations. The slug oozing its way across asphalt expects what? The way back is clear. A thin line of dried iridescence shows it but slugs are all about progress. Look and see its eye stalk stretch, quizzically poke the air in spirals then strain forward. The crushed rock and dried tar simply exist. No creator in sight, just like the forgotten grass. One broken pebble at a time, a series of loose chips and the shining line with no hint of a sudden hand with salt shaker attached a slow world with no obstacles, two inches past the edged turf line, a sprinkle head pops up, sprays a firm watery fan, the edges feather and the ending mist overshoots the grass, forms a circle of partly shining black, a reason to go. I probably should have checked time when I began and I did not. Charlie, Here. did you? We <laughs> still good? Still good? We're fine. We're fine. Okay. I wrote this next poem for Chris Sutliff, and I don't know if anybody in the audience knows Chris Sutliff. She was a long time professor of English at Missouri State who taught technical writing and did just an all around great person who loves turtles. And I wrote this for her titled Turtles. They crawl out from the rock wall, blinking in the spring, the light so flint edged, so different from the padded winter with its long dreams. This is no dream. 
Some nose the cold soil for worms or wait for the incautious fly, serious work in the shifting sun, while brothers, sisters crawl for the river, markings fluttered on shells like dappled leaves rustled by the hawk above. Goodness, I'm going to again. Okay. This is the last of the animal poems. You know, I this one was from a phrase two. Um, I got the names for the animals in this poem from. A, a journal that, a spy journal that my son uh, had, and he gave aliases for the people that he was spying on. You can tell he was fairly young at this point. And so two of his aliases are in this poem because I thought they were so fabulous. Thank you, Ted. What zoo animals say after hours. They call real names like underbelly dark and true claw slim. Soft paw comes out of the artificial cave and calls for her mate, bristle nose, but he's been shipped to Toledo. She comes out each night all the same and calls for him, an act of love, not human, since she knows he isn't there. She smells his lack. The call is her song. And the song does not change just because he no longer feels the harmony. I'm gonna skip another one. Okay, I th I think a lot of poets have been writing poems during the last year about their experiences, and I do have a couple of them about we'll call them COVID poems, but they're not about COVID, they're about us. And um, let me see. I'm deciding which one on the fly. Okay. Yes, this one's called Baking Bread and Karen might be talking about a Missouri anthology that's coming up. I'll let her tell about that, but this will be in that. It takes a slower time, at least I thought it did, but really it slows time to the precision of a mise en place. First, prop the book and brush the dust of past bread from its pages, then lay out the cups, the spoons, flour, sugar, salt, yeast, then liquids, butter, milk, water, erase any guilt using a mixer may give. This is only the base, food for the little yeast <clears throat> little yeastlings. I used to worry about too much or too little flour, but now know how forgiving it is, how the dough speaks, lets me know when it's time to move from bowl to board. When I was young, it was my favorite part and still is the gradual addition of flour through heft, muscle and bone. The book says 10 minutes, but I know other things mark the time. The thump, fold, stretch, thump, fold, stretch, sift is my metronome. And at last I see the gluten glisten. It's humid today in Missouri unlike younger bread mornings in other realms. So the first rise is fast and everything I could want. I punch it lightly and form two loaves, one to keep and one to give away. The smell stays for hours, filling a hunger I forgot I had. That night I slept. I wonder, will I do that one? Okay, I always print out more poems that I'm going to use and decide what I'm going to do. Um, one exercise I give students that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
but it's a good exercise and it's a found object exercise. I ask them to get something from nature and bring it in. If it's something they can bring in without breaking the law, you know, like don't pick flowers in the park. You know, I always say things like that. And in that case, they can take a photograph of it. That's another way to do the found object. This is a found object poem and it's called Buckeye. I like how it feels in my hand, unnaturally smooth and undeniably produced by nature. It fits in the inward curve of my right palm like God made it for that. He or she, depending on the theology, did not, but there it sits, a smooth seed, ready to skip or throw or plant, a kernel of potential, motion encased, forming an equation like David plus the sling equals the fall of Goliath. There it sits, and as I look at it, it stares back at me, and I am fine with that. My soft side also toughened to a hard, finished sheen. Okay, this is the last poem I'm going to read, and um, it's it's a thank you poem to one of my past uh, poetry teachers, and it's also a love song for Kansas. I, you know what you're going to do? I love Kansas, and um, the titles "Ad Astra Per Aspera." You stole the sky from me that day, and I thought I'd never get over it. Then that 50 minute drive from Wichita State to El Dorado was bracketed by the rolling land and heavy sky you wrote. The sky presses down and I felt it press. My inner ear felt the shift that makes the storm to come. saw the low rolling clouds that meet the ground in Kansas, so heavy they indeed feel corporeal, a body too weighted to rise. As I drive, I track those clouds and never tire of it. At times, a small crack of sun streaks out, but it's fast, not even as long as the flick of a passing cow's ear as I drive Highway 254. Later, clouds and rain views and it's like stars never existed. I had to get over that and wrench back my eyes, close them to truly see stars, a sky full of stars, blazing unaccountable stars. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm here to read. Um, I, I picked a poem out while Lynette was reading because I have a poem about um, making bread which is funny, my pandemic poem. Um, I wrote it last year, but I still titled it um, in a funny way. In 2020, we made sourdough. So this was the, during the whole time when we were all trying to make sourdough starter. And um, I'll share with you a little prompt when I'm done with this, if you're interested in a writing project. In 2020, we made sourdough. That was the year we all made bread. It's not that there was a shortage, that we were meeting a need, but something made us pull out our bread machines, our rolling pins, those bags of flour, hard to find because all of us were doing some variant of the same thing, like Lynette. <laughs> Just a minute ago, I fed my starter, stirred in a bit more water and flour. It works like the book said it would. Each day I find it bubbly and alive, smelling more like yeast. I can't help feeling I conjured that life from nothing, but it wasn't me, it's a fungus, always present in the air we breathe. And it found what I left for it, and then it multiplied and kept on the kind of grace you can slice, then toast, then butter. Okay, so the, the kind of fun prompt is, I was never at all successful with my, I never toasted sourdough bread because my sourdough turned stinky and looked like nothing you'd ever want to make into anything edible. So my husband is here, Mike Chisniewski's face is looking at you and he, I have to be honest because he knows the truth about my lack of bread making skills, but you can write a poem that um, allows you to save yourself and um, make you look a little better in um, 
the fictional world of the poem than maybe you do in real life. So I even think it's a fun prompt to write about like in 2021, we did this thing um, and just whatever it is you're doing now becomes the thing that we did. Okay, and uh, one of my prompts was the Roadside America prompt. So I'm gonna read a, an older poem of mine that fits that one. It's called The Museum of Things You Can't Fix. And it tells a true story about my spelling bee experience that you'll hear it in here. I knew the word. I was like one of the last two people in the school spelling bee to move on. And I just knew I had it. So I spit it out super cocky and I stumbled over the letters and you can't go back once you, once the letter leaves your lips, it's, it's, that's how you spell the word. So I lost the spelling bee. So the ironically titled, titled the museum of things you can't fix, but I fix it here. True, it's not your typical museum, butterflies with taped wings, every manner of household appliance, photographs of children unconceived. Your mother is here too in the corner, obviously suffering, but making a brave face of it. You built this place brick by brick, to remind yourself of the correct spelling of tabernacle, something you knew all along but stumbled on and were informed by the judges that starting over was against the rules. The word is chiseled in stone over the doorway. In a lucite box, you'll find that lie you told, polished to a luster. Above it, prayers too heavy to float skyward are suspended from the ceiling by fishing line. You've prepared a room for someone you met too late, and you think the recliner, the magazines, the unopened bag of chips justify every artifact. Invitations have been sent to your ex-boyfriend's wife, your dead dog, all the strangers who got the jobs you wanted, dignified in blue suits. Above the strident telephone that you never reach in time, you practice your greeting aloud. Welcome to my tabernacle, T-A-B-E-R-N-A-C-L-E, -E, tabernacle. You always win the spelling bee in the life of the mind. <laughs> um, I mentioned another poem um, in the prompt area, uh, the customs of grief, where you look at grief kind of like a, a country that you're returning from with all your baggages, baggage that you have to declare. So this is that poem. I've been dealing with grief a lot recently. I'm kind of out of that writing stage, um, but I lost my mother and my best friend and I've um, been just thinking about grief in all kinds of ways. Some of them even kind of funny ways that surprised me, but um, I've just been sort of rolling in it and seeing what what I smell like. <laughs> so this is one of my grief poems, but you'll see it's not a, you're not going to cry or anything. It's kind of funny. Okay, the customs of grief. Because I've spent some time there, someone asked me today about grief and its customs. I thought of it then as a line at the airport where you dare not sneak in the barbed misshapen fruit of that country, nor its national dress made of ashes, nor its currency, which you carve from your own skin like an apple peel that you try to keep in one piece. I have a lot to declare. I've smuggled more than I can carry, though I know I'll be back many times, maybe take up residence by its salt sea, its anthem thick on my tongue. If you've ever lost somebody that you care about, um, it is like that. It's like baggage that you carry and, and um, you, you, you do have a lot to declare. So that's what poetry is good for. Okay, here's a poem about my mother. Um, shortly after she died, I couldn't really see her face. I can see it perfectly now in my um, mind's eye, but I just sort of lost my mom's face. Lynette lost her mother recently too. I don't know if it's uh, something that you can relate to or not, but I just sort of couldn't picture her. If a um, police artist was sitting in front of me, I couldn't describe the culprit. <laughs> it's my mom. Inadequate ode to the face of my mom. I tried to picture my mother, but all I could see was a stone, not the kind with letters and dates, but simpler, small, a plain rock I could hold in my palm, cold and unremarkable. Failure made me feel hard. 
I wished I had studied the grooves of her face, contour map to everything she'd seen. But then I sat in a chair, pulled my son to my chest, and I felt a fault grow, a chasm, and from it heat and light spilled from me, took in my son, the chair, the floors and walls, and by its light I made her out, broken too, and blazing. So I kind of like that discovery I made in this, that I couldn't hold my own child and feel a fault grow. And I realized that this sort of failure that I was feeling, every mom feels that, including my mother. And so this fault or chasm is also like a shared sense of, you know, failing. And then you don't feel like such a failure anymore. Um, so that's good. Poetry is very good for the spirit. <laughs> All right. Here's a poem about writing from Ars Poetica. Um, and um, that, that's another good prompt. If you're not quite sure what to write about, go there and write about your processes and what you're trying to accomplish. This is called The Poet Winnows and Sorts. It's about writer's block. When I have been too long away, I begin not with words, but a series of loops on the page, a little line of hash marks, a scribble. I don't believe the poems leave us. They are always at hand, though sometimes they struggle to ease through. Imagine you have a purse, more like a pouch, really, a bit of hide drawn with a cord, and say it's full of millet, amaranth, some other ancient grain, but also a single gem of no great worth, amber or nephrite, unexpected there among the kernels, nothing you'd welcome in your pottage, but lovely to find in the pouring, something special to turn in your palm, see how it catches the light. So that's a kind of a strange poem about finding a gem in your cereal <laughs> grain, but that's what poetry is. Sometimes you, you try to make like oatmeal and you end up with this gem. <laughs> you're trying to write about the, the workaday stuff and you're just gifted with this special thing that you don't even know what to do with sometimes. Um, writing some poems these days about um, just sort of spiritual realm and uh, you're like loosely theological but very personal so um, this is one of those poems and you have to understand that I kind of come from a, a maybe a um, well, the new thought religious tradition which is more um, like kind of praises the self and would never claim that any of us are are wretched sinners <laughs> it's just a different like different thing so this poem kind of comes from that i am i feel it when i stop to draw deep breaths and fill up from my base a narrow balloon waiting to be bent to its form but sometimes when I'm still, I feel my edges dissolve and then I am both less and more broken this way, smithereened, I get the argument. Maybe I am God, more cloud than sitter on cloud, part of everything there is. You there with your broke openness, I am with you. I slip through your crazing and chips so together we can be whole. Um, let's see. Here's a poem called, it's kind of in the same vein of um, this kind of holy self kind of idea. Um, I'm gonna walk you through a barn burning down and what comes from the ashes. <laughs> Did you know you are luminous? There is nothing you lack. You are both spark and flame, a whole sway-backed barn on fire and burning to the ground. Then your rubble, the foot that kicks up ash, the runes and talismans scuffed into black, the flash of new green that will rise eventually with water and sun and a bit of time. There is so much power in you to grow the tree, to age and plane the wood, to craft a church worthy of the touch of your knees. Taking you to church today. <laughs> 
Um, this poem is called Thanatopsis. Of course, there's a famous poet poem by that name. Um, so Thanatopsis is the consideration of death, basically. Thanatopsis. There are so many ways they can leave us, our people, wired to monitors, swinging from a tree, dropping on a sidewalk. However the universe selects, they manage to find the door, the one marked exit, the single way away. Sister, time is tricky. I don't believe moments line up like beads in a row. They seem more like a wad of foil, building up as each thin layer is tamped. Points touch where we would not expect. Your loss, mine, pressed in, they cleave to one another. Sort of what I discovered through my whole grief journey is that it's actually a thing that connects most people. I mean, most people have had the experience of loss, um, maybe even not the loss of a person, but the loss of something, maybe a situation, a job, a, just something that they cared about. And it is sort of like that um, foil ball that um, there are all these points where we touch, our experiences touch, and we don't even realize it um, all the time. So I'm going to finish with a poem that I uh, think is Im important in this moment as they I've been watching the um, Derek Chauvin case um, kind of religiously. I can't tear my eyes away from the TV and um, the everybody rested today and closing arguments will be on Monday. But this is a poem I wrote shortly after George Floyd died. And I don't know if you've been watching or you remember, but he one of his last things that he did was call out for his mother, mama. And um, I think every mom kind of like sat up and took notice when that happened. We were all kind of on call and on alert. So uh, this is a poem for his mother. It's called Poem for Mama for the mother of George Floyd. Someone kneeled on the neck of a man, and now the man is gone. It's an old story, flesh muscling into flesh, the slim pipe of the trachea opening a little so hardly anything gets in or out, but what does manage to escape is his dead mother's name. I'm mom to my sons, and I want to be a good one. They're white but kind, and the young one doesn't understand. But his brother begins to, and so I beg them both, the way all mothers should, for George's mom, whose name I can't find, but whom we all know as Mama, for Mama, please be a witness, be a witness. And that's it for me. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I don't know if we have anything else going on, Charlie, questions or whatever, but my part's done. <laughs> Thank you both for doing this, even though nobody's shown up, but thank you both for uh, reading your beautiful poems. Mm -hmm.